Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. Hello and welcome to Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. My name is Sarah, and today we'll be diving into a topic that's increasingly in focus, and that is sustainability. Now, in recent years in particular, there's been a real shift in awareness, not just among individuals like you and me, but also among companies that want to make more ethical and greener choices. But what exactly are we talking about when we say sustainability? And what role should it play in how companies create and do business? To answer these and other questions, I'm very pleased to welcome my two guests on today's podcast. They're joining me via the wonders of Skype from Munich. Daniela Bollinger joins us. She's head of sustainable design at BMW. Hello to you, Daniela. Hi. Hello. And also from Munich, we're joined by Michael Held, and now he's the Director of Global Design at Steelcase, which for those of you who may not know, Steelcase is the world's largest manufacturer of office furniture. So hello to you, Michael. Hello, and thanks for having me. All right. So since uh, we can assume that our listeners, our podcast listeners, do already know about BMW and what kind of a company it is, uh, Misha, perhaps we can start um, by having you tell us a little bit more about what Steelcase does and also what your role specifically as director of global design means. Sure. Um You've already mentioned Steelcase is uh, currently the world's largest office furniture manufacturer. Uh, we are around since uh, 1912, and um, Steelcase has been founded on insights, insights around how people work and how work happens in spaces. And uh, one of the first products at the time was a waste basket made out of steel. Um, somebody noticed that in the early early 20th century that a lot of uh, a lot of people were still smoking cigars in offices and sometimes they would just chuck them into a rubbish bin uh, when they were done with them and uh, that caused a lot of fire so it was a big hot fire hazard and that turned into that first product and since then uh, we've been focusing a lot on research around the work workers and the workplace and um that's what we're doing. Um, we're working with uh, some of the world's largest organizations, leading organizations, uh, to help them um, unlock human potential in their uh, workforce and to help workers and their well-being in the workplace. And my role at Steelcase is I'm uh, part of a global design team. I'm actually responsible for what we call the furniture category. Now that's a little bit funny. I mean, we make furniture, but furniture in our terms means desking, storage, and uh, screens, shielding, if you will. It's not part, uh, the category is uh, seating or um, other brands that Steelcase also owns are not part of that. So my team focuses on innovation in office furniture. Okay, so innovation in office furniture. Daniela, you're head of sustainable design at BMW. Can you tell us a bit about what your role is? Well, my role actually is I try to implement the sustainability strategy, which is developed um, within the strategy department at BMW Group. And my role is to introduce sustainability into the design process um, and um, explain in a way what these high-flying strategies are so that the designers understand what they can do, what they might have to do, and um, how to introduce new products or new services um, so that uh, we can actually contribute into the sustainability strategy from the whole, like uh, from the group itself. Okay. Now, the word sustainability, I mean, you can even call it a buzzword at the moment. It is a very complex concept. I mean, there's many different aspects to it. Um, there is one simple definition that's often quoted, and it comes from the UN World Commission on Environment and Development. Uh, why don't I read it uh, out? So we just sort of have, we're on the same page about what we're talking about when it comes to sustainability. So 
Um, this is from the UN. Sustainability focuses on meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And sustainability is understood as having three pillars. They say economic, environmental, and social. And that's also uh, referred to sometimes as profits, planet, and people. Um, Profits, planet, people, it does sound like a real marketing slogan. Daniela, Michael, um, is that also true for the very notion of sustainability? Is it primarily a marketing gag for companies? Is it just hype? How do you see it? Um, I think sustainability has always been good business and not just only since uh, Dieter Rams published his uh, Principles for Good Design. Um, it's something that allows you to be successful um, in the in the long run. I mean, and that's what the definition also that you read uh, already said. So it's um, not wasteful with resources. It's not polluting the environment. It's in the end just good business. So I think it's always been part of what we do. I think, well, if, if I would jump in that, because I think it's the, the basic of sustainability and the basic of being successful in the long run of a business means that you have inherently understand the principles of sustainability. If you only focus on profit and you forget about people or like the environment, um, you will not be successful on the long run. And if you focus only on the environment and not concentrate also on the profit, it's the same problem. So it has to be in a balance, I think, um, to really be successful in the long run, or? Definitely. I mean, as, as we said, the focus does also include profits and the planet and also social responsibility. So making sure that people are taken care of uh, within a company and in, in a company's practices. Now, Misha, maybe you can answer the next question that I have, because there's another phrase that gets thrown around a lot, and that's, the circular economy. Can you perhaps explain to us what that means? Sure. Um, I think the circular economy is really the the way to think about sustainability in a in a more holistic way, and also to connect it back to uh, the economic benefits for an organization. I mean, we call that companies have been focusing on producing something and selling that to others uh, for a very long time, and usually. Afterwards, in the very, very past, you know, if we think about the hundreds of years ago, um, products have been in use for a very, very long time. And if they would break, they would have been repaired. Now, over the last 100 years, that has been changing. There has been abundance of uh, materials. There has been abundance of technologies that allowed us to produce ever more, faster, cheaper to make a lot of products available to a lot of people globally. That had a huge benefit, of course, of uh, lifting many, many people around the world out of uh, poorer living conditions that provided work and economic value to a lot of uh, companies, countries, and, and regions. But it failed to address what we call um, the dark side of the moon, which is basically the other half of the circle of what happens with the products when they are not needed anymore. So that could be, in some cases, for a fashion reason. It could be, in some cases, because they simply break, or it could be because the type of product is simply not needed anymore. All these products contain a lot of resources. There was a lot of energy put into manufacturing those. And the circular economy is trying to address that in a more holistic way of how to gain those energies, those materials back, and put them back into uh, the circle, to keep them actually in the circle, and um, reflect them back into the market so other people can benefit from those energies, from those materials uh, thereafter as well. So there's a, a very strong economic incentive to actually keep materials that are expensive to, uh, to produce, to get in that circle and keep on using them. And Misha, what you describe, taking the energy that's present in materials and reapplying that energy to create something new. It, I mean, this idea of circular economy, the first thing that comes to my mind, of course, is the BMW i3. Now, Daniela, you have to uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I do remember reading um, that that car 
can use as many as 27 recycled bottles um, and that the car itself is 95% recyclable. Is that is that right? I know you were very closely involved in the development of the i3. Can you tell us a bit about it? Well, um, well, when we start calculating all the bottles um, which were in the textile, I think you're referring to, and the floor mats and the and the sky materials. So, um, I think uh, this is something when we the first time really thought about using recycled materials in a premium product. And I think that was that was what you're referring to. It's um, it is first of all, and that was Michael said, um, we are using materials which were already in the cycle as uh, the PET bottles from where you normally drink your water from. And then we actually processed this into yarn and made a new fabric out of it. And then we put this material in the car. So this is already the first closed loop. The recycling of the whole car is then a really tricky issue. I mean, there is there are regulations right now that a car has to be recyclable up to 95%. But I think that's something what we both um, think a lot about is what is this recycling about? Is it what Michael said that you're going to take out materials out of the product, the car, um, furniture to make them recyclable means that they have to be out of only one single material. I guess you agree, Michael, that if materials are melted together, it's really hard to recycle them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we also try to avoid with these kind of products is to um, stop bonding them together. So it's much easier to kind of take them apart again and use the materials again. I mean, that concept has been, even before the circular economy, known for a longer time as a cradle-to-cradle -cradle concept. Um, we've actually manufactured, I think, one of the first cradle-to-cradle -cradle, uh, products in 2005. It's an office chair called Think. Um, there's currently the second generation in the market, and um, that, that chair allows you at the end of its use to be taken apart with all the materials perfectly separated. You can take it apart very, very quickly without too many tools. It's, it's only a few parts. So you can take those parts and put them back into the recycling cycle and use those parts again. So um, yeah, definitely one of the key things is to avoid and mixing and bonding materials so you can't take them apart anymore. That's at least a really big first step. Yeah, interesting is that you're gonna mention the uh, cradle to cradle. The leather we actually developed for the i3, which was the first time leather, which is vegetable tent, was also certified by cradle to cradle. Um, so because the material itself can be put uh, back into the into, into the loop is because it, the, the tanning process is so harmless and um, it's so positive. So we were nominated for that uh, material. Uh, even so, again, it's tricky because when you start then building up all these products, which are tied together, which are, I don't know, you're, you're sewing it together, then how to get a, how to actually dismantle all that. I think that is the biggest challenge. It's, I mean, we have products like a car, which has over 10,000 different materials within this one product. So you can imagine that the challenge for us is extremely high. Yeah. I mean, cars are quite complex compared to the kind of products that we, uh, that we manufacture, chairs and, uh, and desks and the likes. There's, of course, more complexity than maybe most people expect, but uh, compared to a car, it's actually um, little. I think another aspect that's actually important is the long longevity of a product. So I, I don't know about the average life cycle of cars today, but but my guess would be it would be somewhere between 10 and 20 years. Maybe it's longer. Um, I don't know. Is that correct, roughly? Yeah, oh, well, it depends, um, I guess, for how long these cars will be sold again and sold again and sold again. But uh, like warranty wise, we are taking care about 10 years of the car. And then it gets into the next circles and next circles. <laughs> yeah, that's quite similar to our business. I mean, we're currently sitting here in a room um, with very nice leather lounge chairs. And so leather is one of those materials that's interesting, right? Because it's uh, the way leather is produced is obviously up for discussion, right? There's a, the, the whole um, industry around meat and uh, any other animal products, if you will, uh, is, is obviously under scrutiny. And so it's good that there's maybe a first step of a uh, more environmentally friendly tanning process. 
On the other hand, people forget that a good leather product can last for a very, very long time compared to many other products today that might be um, made in a different way and might be recycled in a different way. But one of the things we also like to think about is the longevity of a product. So how long is that product actually useful until you have to put energy into getting materials out of it again and can remanufacture it? And I think that's sometimes forgotten when we talk about uh, the type of materials that are used. Yeah, but then I would love to agree that um, on that and especially pointing out our jobs and we are designers. So I think it also connects and the chairs we are sitting in there are designed, I know, 60 years ago or I mean, because they have this beautiful design. Leather has also um, its legitimacy or <laughs> um, because it is a design which lasts forever because it's a beautiful design. And I like to talk about all these fast designs, which are pretty fast out of fashion because they don't really um, they don't really appeal for a very long time. And then I think the problem is if you have very high impact materials you use and you throw this away because it's not fashion anymore, then it's a contradiction. So what you're what you're referring to, I think, makes total sense if the product is used for a very long time because also the design is it's made for that and it's designed like that. Um, I can see with all this fast fashion and fast product usage and um, that people don't really recognize the, the quality and also the, as I said, the embodied energy with this whole product has. And people don't cherish these uh, things too much anymore. And, and, and that's, I think, it's a contradictory for me in itself. I'd like to jump in uh, to touch upon something that both of you mentioned, and that is this new way of tanning leather. I think it's a reminder that when we're talking about sustainable materials, we can be talking about natural materials that are ecologically sourced and renewable, so not created using toxic uh, substances in addition to the recycled materials like plastics. And what I'm wondering, though, is how open are consumers to paying a premium price for a luxury item that was partly made out of recycled plastic, which essentially used to be trash? Do you feel that people are open to that, or is there still some skepticism? In my experience, um, sustainability or sustainable products and materials don't have to cost a premium. Uh, it depends how they are positioned. I think we are operating today in, a, in an economic environment that has not been incentivized to, uh, to yield those results all the time. As I said, I think the last century was, an, was a century where we kind of like developing towards abundance and lower costs and didn't actually calculate the costs of the impact that was not directly associated with the products. And I think that is something that has been dramatically uh, changing today. So I feel that um, definitely products that are sustainable um, are the ones that uh, people nowadays are choosing more and more over other products. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally with you. I mean, I, I did an apprenticeship as a goldsmith and uh, the only thing you do when you're a goldsmith, you collect all the metals because they're so valuable and then you melt it again and uh, or people bring old jewelry and then you make new jewelry out of it. So nobody would talk about a trash or old stuff because it has a high value. But uh, it, I think interesting is for us as well, uh, the communication about it, uh, because I wouldn't even call it trash. I mean, that's something which I think we can actually leave behind now. Or, totally. I mean, we are we are now uh, how how many years we are doing this recycling thing? Probably twenty years now. We introduced recycling, I think, in the in the early nineties in 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 Germany, like the real recycling system in a bigger system in, in a, a bigger, in a bigger way. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. absolutely. No, I fully agree. I think uh, trash is a totally wrong word. I mean, we we're taking materials, we use them for a while in a particular way, and we're trying to reuse them in a different way afterwards. I think that's the whole point beyond uh, the whole point of uh, circular economy is to take these materials and use them again for a different purpose. On the other hand, uh, longevity on products can also be achieved by replacing parts of them. So not just repairing, but if there's a fashion element to it, 
um, we don't want to tell people that fashion is a bad thing. I mean, I love fashion. I definitely love fashion. But um, I love fashion more if the things last long and if they can potentially be repaired or if the company even offers to repair them or update them. So, for example, in our business, if you uh, own a couple of chairs and after a few years living with them or a few decades, you feel that they could use some new fabric, they could use a new cover, a different color or something, then um, I would be much in favor of of repairing, updating, upgrading the product rather than than throwing away the whole thing. I th it's, uh, that is something, it's funny because we always refer to the furniture industry when we talk about our seats, because we have the same situation. You're sitting in a car, you're not standing in a car. And then uh, we always envy the industry because you can easily replace the covers. And that's really something extremely tricky for the automotive industry, um, that you replace covers and replace um, fabrics because you have so many requirements on the fabric and also on the seat below because there's so much technology in the car. Yeah, so we always look to your industries and like, oh, we would love to upgrade the seat cover or anything. And um, that's really, that's something we are working on since years. Um, and it's a huge challenge for us. I think it's a typical um, supply chain manufacturing problem that uh, just needs to be solved, right? So in our case as well, I mean, different types of manufacturing uh, a chair um, lead to different costs ultimately for uh, for customers. And so sometimes um, seat covers have been in the past just stapled very quickly to the underside of, of chairs, and that has been covered again. So if you want to um, <clears throat> reupholster a chair like that, it's quite a laborious process to get rid of the old cover, to, to the old fabric, to clean the whole thing again and upholster it again. But if it's designed from the beginning as a cover that can be easily uh, with a zipper, with, a, with buttons, with a drawstring or something like that, opened and pulled off. Uh, it's on the one hand easier to recycle because the materials, again, they're not glued together, they're not stapled together or something like that. Um, and you can just use a new cover and put it on top. So that's certainly something that should be possible in the car industry as well, but I'm pretty sure it would have massive impact on the way those seats are made today, the way they're specified, uh, how they have to perform. I mean, we have a lot of regulations that we have to meet. I'm sure the car industry has even tougher ones. Mo <laughs> I can give more, you some of mine. <laughs> more. Uh, so it's 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 certainly harder to do, but it's, it's it seems to me like an incredible appealing design problem to actually think about one component to such a level of detail mm -hmm. that you can come up with a totally new solution that is not available in the market today. Yeah, that's definitely a, a, a huge challenge for us. But um, it's also very, um, uh, I think we are extremely um, curious if we can solve problems like this. This is something which I think exactly when we point out circular economy, which is something which leads us in the future. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that this is uh, pro product design or it's an architectural design, um, how we have to do it. We are running out of resources. We are getting, we are really getting in a lack of materials, and especially because we have so many special materials in the car. And I think one thing where we are pr very proud at the moment is that we are, um, we had a group of young um, engineers who designed a floor mat. I mean, just a boring floor mat, yeah? The stuff where you, what you put in the car so that um, it gets dirty. And whenever you sell your car, the floor mat will be replaced and will be thrown away. And normally it goes in the integration plant and will be burned because it's made out of, I think, over eight materials, just a floor mat. So this group, they got a challenge, this small floor mat, and they made it out of recycled material and also um, out of just one single material. And it's super interesting because everybody would say, why do you need six materials in the floor mat? Oh, maybe because the requirements, they were from the 50s when you were having a, a like you were driving open and there was rain coming in the car. And, and nowadays everything is electric. so. You will not be have a flood in your car anymore. But the, just to, to, to tackle this small issue would mean that you can replace all floor mats in all cars and recycle them and get the material back. And I think that is 
it's, it's a small step, but uh, it's a huge amount of material you can actually replace. That's what I love about these little projects, because they have, at the end, they have huge impact, right? They look like it's a small thing, but I don't know exactly how many cars uh, you guys are selling, but like in most cars, there are at least four floor mats, I guess, mm -hmm. and probably something in the trunk as well. So if you calculate that on an annual basis, the amount of material, the amount of, of parts that are made yeah. in a different way, in a more sustainable way, is quite substantial. It might be a small step in the overall scheme of things, but that's why these things are so important. And I think also the history that you mentioned about like where those requirements come from, that's what we're facing today because over decades and decades in the last century, uh, requirements have been added, um, things have become more complex. We discovered new chemical compounds that solved one issue. A few years later, we realized that there's a new issue because of the yes, chemicals, exactly. that, chemicals that we used uh, a few years earlier. So we, we, we found another thing. I think what we do today is like we rediscovering um, simplicity as well in those kind of single materials, but it's incredible hard to get there. So I'm pretty sure that team worked hard. And at the end, maybe uh, some people said, okay, guys, great. You came up with a new floor mat so what i mean uh, it's not a big deal but i find those are really the interesting engineering and design problems to really focus on and um step by step get to a better product mm -hmm. in the end better for not only the environment but also for the company and for the users ultimately i think um there's another uh, a topic we were just talking about before is also do you really have to see that it's made out of recycled material and um or yet do you have to talk about it and um i think when we start the i3 that was the first time when we thought about sustainability within the in an interior and an exterior and um, we thought we have to make it a little bit visible so that it looks different but also make it more material driven design so that we really thought into the material and the texture of of or the natural flow of the material and um, try, yeah you're <laughs> yeah and and we try to make it visible but I think since this is, um, well, we started the project 2008 and we launched a car 2012. It's eight years, eight years ago now. And I think we learn, I mean, we learn that it, you don't have to really show it. And we need new words for recycling or for recycled materials. And it's, it's, I think that is the lack we have not, right now we do, don't really have, um, the good communication wording for all that. What is it in your industry similar? I mean, the question was asked earlier also about like, is it a hype? Is it a marketing term that at the moment um, people just uh, think is important? I feel at the end of the day, it's about the value that you get from something that you're using. And as long as the value is great, you probably don't care if it's recycled, reused, uh, virgin material or not, um, you, you really, I think, uh, I think people care about the value that they get from, uh, from products. The i3 is an interesting example. Um, the first time I sat in one, uh, is when I, when I signed up for, I think now it's called share now, mm -hmm. uh, the, the car sharing program, um, and uh, obviously, I was curious about that car. I wanted to to, to know how uh, driving an electric car. I, I drove another electric car before, um, but I wanted to to feel how a how a BMW feels, especially one that looks and I looked at the time in in many people's eyes. Uh, I think quite odd, right? <laughs> Unusual for a car. And what I found uh, really interesting about it was not so much the exterior. It certainly you know um, made a point about being different. What I really liked about the interior, and you used one of the words already, is the richness of textures, which is usually quite absent, absent in cars because a lot of the surfaces, or they used to be absent, it's a little bit more now, um, the, you, the, the surfaces are quite clinical and sterile often, or very technical. So they're about the reflections and, and mm -hmm. highlights mm -hmm. and, and, and lighting and things like that that have nothing to do with humans. And so what I really liked about the i3 interior um, is, and we can debate forever if, if, if the design is the best design or not, that doesn't really matter. What I really liked about it is that it's humanizing. Mm -hmm. It's a human environment. It's mm -hmm. a human interior. And that's actually a concept that for us is very important in the office world as well. Um, there are a lot of people that um, 
and I think Dilbert is probably uh, the best example of that, that have been making fun of the corporate work environment. In the US, that's a little bit more cubicles. In uh, here in Germany, it's a little bit more the group or cell offices uh, where people sit in together. But most offices have a very corporate feel. Somebody decided that this is the right color for something. Somebody decided it has to be very easy to clean and there shouldn't <laughs> be too many things that are um, alive, mm -hmm. like plants. Or personal stuff. Uh, yeah. Personal things. And, and so a lot of uh, corporate offices have been emphasizing the brand of the company over the how I feel as an employee mm -hmm. for a long time. And this is something that has been changing the last years. This is something that has been radically changing. There's a lot more a residential type of furniture objects, finishes and materials have been have been brought into the office. I mean, we're sitting in, in four lounge chairs in a BMW office, maybe not something that would have been very common uh, 10, 20 years ago. I don't know. I mean, I'm just guessing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this is something that uh, we can see across industries that people like to be environments that feel more natural and human. Now, mm -hmm. if the, all the materials in there are always like 100% natural, or if they're all recycled, or if everything is sustainable, that's that's an additional question. But I think really the, the, the umbrella uh, over all of that is that we want to feel more human. That's interesting when you mention uh, the re reference to your business, because when we started the design of the i3, uh, we were looking into rooms and furniture, and um, this was the association we had, and also fashion. Um, so we tried to connect all that um, and make it very, and as I said before, material-driven design. So we were looking at the purpose, at the abilities of the material and, or the material flow. So. Um, for example, we had we have a textile in there. It was the first time that we did that. But we connected uh, like polyester and wool, and the wool had these small knots in it because that's the nature of wool. You cannot calculate this, the the yarn, and so we had these small knots all over. And we said, "Oh God, that will be never accepted in the quality department." So what we do is we do a salt and pepper design, so you don't see it that good. And I think that is something which I uh, understand more and more that we have to really design the materials within its, uh, its structure and its abilities or how the material comes and don't try to break the material into shapes and forms. Um, that is so much energy you need and so much more effort you have to put into the pieces. And also you have a lot of pieces you have to throw away because um, of failure of surfaces. So I think that is something which has to majorly change also in the car industry, the acceptance of what you would call probably failure, which shouldn't be a failure, which should be a beauty mark or uh, a natural, something which comes naturally with this material. It's not isolated to the car industry in my mind. It's, it's something that came with industrial process and trying to co control quality. And, and if you ask people to make a decision if something is the right quality or not, you have to give them specifications. Mm -hmm. And so you have to say, this is my upper limit, this is my lower limit, anything beyond that we won't accept. And I think this is something that has been driving us towards that uh, more and more perfected uh, interiors, uh, materials, surfaces and the likes that felt less and less human because humans are all different like none of us is symmetric we all look very very different and and yet we don't really have a, a problem kind of uh, talking to each other at least not most of the time um and i think what we're seeing today is that uh, people accept that natural materials are natural materials and um, certain processes yield certain results in the past we've been probably most used to that by the work of craftspeople a good craftsman wouldn't have given you something with a flaw that they thought would weaken the product, would make it less desirable or something like that. They would have used that part and made something out of it. Mm -hmm. But today in a factory, you don't have craftspeople most of the time. You have people that follow processes and regulations. And um, this is also something that's changing, I feel. Like we in our business, um, and I think a, a, a sub-brand of Steelcase called Coalesce have been pioneering that to talk about modern craft. So uh, one of the areas where we uh, 
where we got into that was, for example, with carbon fiber manufacturing. Not the most sustainable mm -hmm. process in the mm -hmm. world, obviously, and the material in itself has its problems in terms of recyclability. Um, it has high performance, high longevity, um, potentially. So it, it's, it's another one of those materials that you have to look in, in more facets to it. But the interesting thing about making things out of carbon fiber, and I know that the, the, the chassis, I think, of mm -hmm. the i3 is made of carbon fiber, is that it's basically a craft process. Mm -hmm. It's a process that you would usually have found um, in um, in textile factories where pe a lot of people work with their hands. So you have to have cut patterns that have to be laid up in an incredible precise way, like stitching things in an incredible mm -hmm. precise way. Until you get to this perfect result, it's very laborious. You You need to train the people that work with that material quite well. And so... In our view, this is something that, that is also a good example of this beginning of, of what we would call modern craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exactly what's something we're looking also deeper into is the beauty of old craftsmanships. And it's something like when you go to Japan, um, so many beautiful surfaces or materials, and you just see a depth of a, of a lacquer, and then they tell you that they put a hundred layers on that lacquer so that you can see this beautiful depth or something like, like stuff like that. And um, these are these kind of like super highlights when if you could put something like this in a, in an interior, and now the interior would be the car, for example, which would be then this. Um, um, I would, yeah, this, this lighthouse thing in this one particular environment, because you, then you can you cherish that and this is handicraft and it could look different. All the, every car could look a little different. I would love that. I would love if we, if we leave all the quality requirements a little bit um, like off board and don't have all these reference books, which are so stiff which you just refer to. It's like, this line is not in the reference book. We cannot do that in the car. I'm like, oh, come on. It's a wood. I mean, this wood is not replaced. Like, you cannot even, like, copy the wood. It's just natural. It's so hard when we had to train the quality department for the i3. Oh, my gosh. And they were just calling all the time. And this wood looks different, has a different color. I'm like, yes, accept it. You can accept it. You can accept everything. Please just accept everything. And so we did. And they were saying our customers will never accept that. They will come and they will come and complain because they order a certain picture and then they, they, the delivery of the car looks different, the wood. Nobody was complaining because it was done in a very perfect, beautiful way. So I think that is uh, this, this shift we have to come to and, and communicate more and talk more about the beauty and aesthetic of natural natural marks, the, uh, developments in surfaces, so ever. Yeah, I think, yeah. Definitely, I mean, it sounds like you had to actually train people uh, to some degree. Uh, you have to retrain them um, to become a little bit closer to what uh, what crafts people are, to be able to to make a decision if something is on the right level or not. And this is might be intuitive for some people that maybe spend time in you know, with other craftspeople or in countries like Japan who really know um, a lot about different craft techniques, have seen a lot of different things. So it might be quite natural for them, but many of the people that um, that are, you know, going through um, apprenticeships or uh, university studies or the likes and being told that this is correct and this is wrong, for them, it's really, really hard to make those kind of decisions. And I think that is something that is also that needs to change a little bit in the industrial environment of how things are made today. And I think therefore those kind of processes and those kind of products that kind of pioneer something like that are incredibly important because yes, there will be a few mistakes along the way and there will be problems that we have to solve, but those kind of learnings will then be part of any other uh, development that comes after it. So you can build on top of that. So I think it's quite valuable and important to do that. It's been so interesting just listening to the two of you go into such detail about the work that you do, changing mindsets. I'd like to now do the opposite rather than detail. I'd like to pick your brains in a more abstract way. Um, perhaps 
I can give you three sort of phrases, and I'd like each of you to just immediately tell me what comes to your minds. So let's start with Daniela. When I say the following, what comes to your mind? So sustainability hero. Sustainability hero? I think that's a very, very tough question. That's because really whatever, tough. <laughs> Whatever okay, you whatever okay, whatever okay. you answer, you could probably find reasons why that company or that person or something shouldn't be. I think uh, you know you asked about the circular economy and, and certainly Alan MacArthur, Alan MacArthur, you know, the right. founder and yeah. name giver of the Alan MacArthur That's... Foundation today is somebody. He would say it's amazing. Of, of course, uh, Greta Thunberg from uh, Fridays for Future, and I think the activism that that she helped to kind of. Uh, you know, catalyzed last year. Um, I think those are really standout, uh, standout achievements and and personalities, and we can only hope that that leads to bigger change. Yeah, and uh, exactly. I'm I'm so happy that you mentioned uh, these movements um, uh, with Ellen MacArthur, who is really personally also my hero, and she she connects also to the premium industry at the moment. You can see Stella McCartney is jumping on. Um, you can see um, Adidas is uh, joining. IKEA just joined the Ellen MacArthur team, and they also go into the circularity. I'm. We're working very close and talk a lot to Ellen MacArthur team to learn from them. You too. Yeah, 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 we yeah. Too. So, um, so we are pledging for 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 working with them more intensively. And then you also said that Greta, and I think um, it was very interesting to see all the presentations how they changed within the company. And you could see that there's that there come, Greta came into into the the pledge for sustainability. And um, so we just have now to really be careful that uh, it not uh, turning into the opposite. That people say I'm so bored with all that ecological movements. Now we have COVID, and I think that is that now is 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 a real big chance for us also to redesign our businesses to purpose, redesign our um, vision into a kind of attitude. Where do we want to position our companies in the future? And uh, I can I, I, I learn at the moment that also we um, are getting much more bold about our visions to a sustainable future within the group. We want to commit each. Uh, we are committed to the Paris uh, Agreement, and we are developing at the moment real all the steps what we have to come up with to to lead into a future in 2030 on a on a Paris Agreement, a climate agreement which is extremely tough. Uh, I don't know how, how you guys uh, do that at Steelcase, but I guess you have a real deep dive team who also looks for our, your, your carbon footprint uh, goals. Definitely. I mean, we have a larger team that looks at sustainability. I mean, there are many more experts. I mean, I'm not a ex sustainability expert. I'm, I'm in product development. I'm, I'm exposed to that topic a lot and I work with that team a lot, but we have on a company level, of course, our own uh, goals and strategic, um, yeah, parts of our strategy that uh, that will help us achieve those. On our product development side, we of course look at that as well and translate that uh, translate that over time, generation over generation. But um, I think we talked a little bit about the longevity of products earlier. The the changes sometimes take time because there's a lot of furniture already in the world. There's a lot of cars already in the world and the cycles, and I know the cycles at BMW have been getting shorter, like all car makers, our cycles have been getting shorter, but until really the whole uh, portfolio is uh, fully sustainable, that will take some time. And that's not because there's no willingness. It's just simply there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, to get that on the right level. Okay, I have another phrase for the two of you and feel free either one of you to jump in, uh, whoever would prefer to go first. So what comes to mind when I say sustainability setback? Well, I think uh, Daniela said it before. I think it's COVID uh, at the moment, I would say. Um, it's certainly something that um, is top of mind for everybody around the world right now. And um, a lot of the discussion that we had around Fridays for Futures died down or had to be, you know, had to take a backseat 
because we have a, a big pandemic problem around the world right now. Also, when you look at small little things that we've all been trying to do, I mean, you want to support maybe your local restaurants that you can't visit anymore. So you go there and you get some takeaway food. Not every restaurant had really great uh, packaging um, so you could actually take away that food. And so uh, I feel um, over the last couple of months, the, the topic probably took a backseat for all of us individually. And we said, well, I can't care about this right now. I have to, you know, sanitize my hands or wear a mask or um, package things in a different way. Supermarkets have been wrapping things more than they did before. It seemed uh, you could still, of course, buy on the market your, your fruits and vegetables uh, by the piece. But then some people might have told you, you, you shouldn't touch things and just put them back. You have to then buy them. So maybe the next time you just didn't do that anymore. So I'm, I'm pretty sure this has had, a, had, a, had an impact that's quite big because it's for everybody. Okay, I have one last one for you. Again, feel free to jump in, whoever is inspired. Uh, sustainability goal. Well, um, I guess that's something where I would refer to the sustainability goals of the United Nations first hands. Uh, we just... Um, we will look, I think every company should really look deep into all these uh, sustainability goals and, and reframe them for themselves and uh, really um, start working with, with sustainability goals within their company. And it's either you refer to the uh, SDGs or you're gonna, I think you need a very good perspective from the outside to the inside to your company to develop the right goals where you want to and also where you have to go to. Because um, sometimes what I realize over my time of uh, working in the sustainability field is that your perceived perception of what you have to do is sometimes different to the real, real, real perception what you should do. Um, because you think you have to come up with certain solutions which are probably not really leading into into this kind of sustainable future you really want to aim for. But uh, it's really, really important that you set sustainability goals. And I think one thing I want to also point out, it's really important that they come from the top. Um, if the top of the company, if the board is not convinced and going and leading sustainability within the company, it is really hard for a bottom-up development. You need that too. You need a kind of, kind of riot and you need a bottom up development too and people who really push it. But you need also clear commitment. Otherwise, it's a long, very long process and a very, very hard way <laughs> to do it. <laughs> Definitely agree. And today also customers are pushing for this. So it gets ah, interesting, a, yeah. it's, get, it's getting a little bit easier. Like um, 10 years ago, it might have been hard to convince some people to go for this. I mean, I've been working in the consumer electronics industry before, and we've been, we had many attempts of trying to uh, develop and, and design sustainable packaging for uh, small electronic items. And at the end of the day, a question that you asked earlier always came up, like, would people pay more for that? Because it was more effort to make it more sustainable or not. Well, 10 years later, a lot of that packaging is so much more sustainable mm -hmm. than it used to be. Uh, and now some companies are even pledging that by 25, by 28, by 30, everything will be fully uh, recycled, recyclable, sustainable, circular. We, we're talking about reusable packaging now. Um, so this is a topic that's also driven by customers. So a while back, it might have been hard to convince people. Today, people ask for it, actually. And so it gets a lot easier to do that kind of work within organizations. Well, talking about goals or initiatives, I'm curious to hear from both of you whether there are any sustainability initiatives or sustainable products that you're currently working on that you're particularly excited about. If you can share that with us and maybe tell us when the rest of us will get to experience it. Uh, well, I mean... Um... What we definitely uh, love to is at the moment when I refer to this kind of like new products, mono material, recycled uh, input and also bringing it back into the circle. I think personally, my fascination goes into this deeper dive into circular economy 
what we just talked about it before and really go deeper into the structure of, of the product of the car um, and understand what kind of responsibility you have and also understand the beauty of new designing st uh, cars under this kind of new paradigm and or these new questions, I would say. Um, that is something which really uh, makes me happy when I see that we get more and more sketches uh, already implementing these requirements of circular economy or even all what we, you, you mentioned, Michael, reducing, reusing, recycling, all this kind of like um, adjectives or how to design a better product. Yeah, next to the, um, I think to the details about materials and how, how things are made, um, we, we've been focusing a lot on those kind of elements like fabrics that were um, made either out of recycled uh, bottles as well or made out of offcuts from our production of other fabrics, uh, for example. Um, the elements that I think are, are currently quite uh, in focus is uh, flexibility because products that are more flexible are more useful longer than products that are less flexible. If a product is too specific and spoke, bespoke to one particular situation right now, uh, it might not, you know, it might not be the right product uh, in two or three years. I think a lot of people are experiencing that at the moment. Uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, our customers and offices experiencing that. If you have optimized your interiors, for example, too much for costs and real estate efficiency, then you have a problem now because the people are too dense in an office and you can't use the furniture in any other way than the one way how they are installed at the moment. So products that are a little bit more flexible, I think is one of the key things here as well. And another aspect is, and we haven't touched on that, is, is, is business models. Um, I think it's not just a question about materials, recyclability and, and the likes, but it's also account. It's also about what are you going to do with the products when they're not needed anymore? Today, uh, in many cases, we might not be part of that discussion as a manufacturer because once the products are installed on the customer side, it's we lose control over them, if you will. It might be a little bit different in the car industry because you still have service um, attached to it. But but I guess even there, there's a secondary market, there's a third market. Uh, you don't know where the where the products end up, and um, I think business model innovation is is one of the things that will be um, more important moving forward um, than just looking at materials and 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 hope that they're all gonna get recycled and hope that they're all gonna you know end up in new products again. The question really is like. How can we ensure that that actually happens and how can we make that part of the value that we deliver to our customers? Daniela mentioned the importance of top-down leadership uh, on sustainability. So when boards and CEOs are dedicated to incorporating the values of sustainability into their companies, nothing really happens. Um, but what about the role of design departments? What role do you play in driving sustainable change at your companies? Well, I think, I mean, doing everything that we talked about in, in, uh, in so far, it's like putting forward uh, those ideas and making them tangible. I think one of the, one of the uh, we, use, we call them superpowers of, of design is that you can create something where there was nothing before. And by that, I mean, not just like a presentation or some images or some words, but you can build prototypes, prototypes that people can actually use and experience. You can put something in front of them. And um, a tricky thing about the human brain, and, I, and Daniela is smiling because I think I told her that story before, is um, once you've seen something, it's very, very hard to unsee it. Once you experience something, it's very, very hard to forget about a good experience. Well or a bad one <laughs> also. So there's a danger in that, of course. So if ideas are too early, too fragile, you might not want to put them out too far yet. But I see our role very much in helping the company discuss things that are hard to talk about, things that are hard to imagine, um, tough questions, and put forward ideas 
and prototypes so people can actually talk about them and said, no, we're definitely not going to do this, perhaps. And, and there's value in that as well to uh, help the company to come to clarity. And I think a design department plays an incredible important role in this overall process to help make those ideas and discussions tangible. I totally agree. I absolutely, I love this phrase when we talked about it before. Um, I think it's funny because we were just hired again for disrupting a project. They, the, the engineers, they, they invited design to visualize ideas they cannot imagine. And I think that's exactly what, uh, what you were mentioning. It's, it's really cool position to really challenge uh, situations, make it visible. Um, and that's the beauty because it was what you said, it was just coming so clear to my mind. Yes, yeah, I have always a hard time to put stuff down on paper because then it's there and then I can see it and then I refer to it and then I can relate and then I start relating. And that's why I also, I, it's hard for me to work with mood boards um, because then you have this picture or this image of this guy with this jacket and then it's because everybody would see that and would refer to this particular thing. And I said, no, 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 it's just this kind of reference in my brain and there are like 50,000 other pictures and images in my brain. Um, so that's exactly what you mentioned. I love that. Yeah. Well, I'd like to conclude by asking you to look uh, a bit further in the future, let's say 10 or let's say 20 years from now, where do you see BMW and Steelcase on the sustainability journey? Well, I mean, cool if I would know that. <laughs> but um, I mean, if we continue the journey on, on what we start now, um, I personally think that cars will not be defined by cars anymore. I think we talk more about mobility as a service. We still want to be uh, flexible. But I think the stiffness of this kind of one product will be gone. And I, I think it's much more smoother integrated into the cities. And I think also that um, we will get much more in urban planning, we will be much more included so that it's not the car is not the envy of the street and of the people who live on streets, but it's a part of mobility. And you might end up choosing what kind of uh, transportation you need for that particular purpose. But then there will be also cars. Um, I don't know how they will look like. They might be driving by themselves, but they might not be parked in the city anymore because we don't want to see all this uh, empty cars standing around. But um, they will play a role, but it will have a total new definition of how we use cars. And for a steel case, what's the future of furniture? Well, <laughs> I think the future of furniture, that, that is something I'm being willing to predict, actually, uh, because we've, you know, as humans, we've been using the same, the same type of furniture for thousands of years. Um, chairs and tables, um, I guess they will be around in 10, 20 years. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Um, I think what is what we see changing um, is like what we define as the workplace or the office or how we think about work. Uh, I think work is sometimes felt as a burden because you have to go somewhere and then sit somewhere in a particular way. I talked about these corporate environments before, and we've already seen that softening and changing over the last decades quite dramatically. I think co-working, the third place discussion around, uh, like I can work in a Starbucks. And I think now with this COVID situation, we've actually have now the proof that technology is good enough to do most everything from anywhere. That doesn't mean that the office will go away. I think the office is incredible, important and needed as a place for us as social animals to you know, be with each other and to meet and to collaborate. But we also know that sometimes it's easier to be alone at home or in another place and focus and get some work done. So what I think what we will be seeing is a much broader mix of how work actually happens and how work is defined. And there will be more different types of spaces where people will work. Some of them might be home. Some of them might be co-working, third places. Some of them might be called offices. We probably see more diversity there and environments that take the human more into the center than they did in the past. Michael Held from Steelcase and Daniela Bollinger from BMW. It's been a real pleasure taking part in this conversation with you. So thank you so much to both of you 
for sharing your vision and your knowledge and your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, inviting us to this uh, great uh, podcast. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a great discussion. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Changing Lanes. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. You can also find out more about sustainability at BMW and many other topics by going to our website. That's bmw.com. I'm Sarah. Thanks for listening. 